Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Rent Prep for Landlords. This is episode number 316, and we're going to be talking about data trends in real estate in a COVID-19 world. So this is kind of a follow-up to last week's podcast, which we talked about a mass exodus from cities. But I found some recent articles that are very interesting, giving some data on what is happening right now, where people's interest lies and where they are looking at when it comes to real estate. And there's some pretty convincing data uh, from some very reliable sources on what people are looking at and where the trends are starting to shift towards. So we're going to be talking about that in today's podcast. We're going to get to that right after this. Welcome to the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast. And now your host, Eric Worrell. So we got two articles we're going to cover today. The first one is the rising interest in rural and small town real estate by Brad Cartier. Uh, This is on fool.com and a very interesting article where it breaks down some data from the popular uh, website Redfin. So it says, over the past few months, urbanites have been faced with a much different reality than those living in more rural and smaller communities. Higher sickness levels, difficulties accessing basic necessities, and limited space have pushed many city residents to explore real estate purchases outside of urban settings. So this is all stuff that we've been talking about, but the part that I think is really interesting is this upcoming paragraph I'm going to read to you here that gives uh, some actual data towards it. It says, a report from Redfin highlights this trend, showing that by late March, the seven-day average change in page views of homes in rural and small towns was up, get this, 115% for rural areas and 88% for small towns respectively. So further, the decline in pending sales was less dramatic in small towns than in urban ones. According to Redfin lead economist Taylor Marr, the ongoing pandemic has shined a bright light on one of the historic downsides of density, the possibility for spread of disease. It will remain to be seen if it shifts in demand away from urban metros last or is temporary. So in Redfin's 2020 first quarter earnings call, Redfin CEO Glenn Kelman said, we're also preparing for a seismic demographic shift towards smaller cities. Prior to this pandemic, the housing affordability crisis was already driving people from large cities to small, and now more permissive policies around uh, remote work and a rising weariness about close quarters will likely accelerate that trend. Kelman continued, he said, since March 15th, searches for homes and towns with populations under 50,000 people increased 71%. He added that more people will be leaving uh, San Francisco, New York, and even Seattle, and some for nearby towns like Sacramento and Tacoma that are close enough to support a weekly office visit and others uh, for a completely remote uh, life in Charleston, Boise, Bozeman, or Madison. Uh, so that's really interesting. Uh, you know, it, 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 not that search volume necessarily predicts actual sales volume, right? But the fact that population of 50,000 had an increased search volume of 71% since March 15th. It says a recent Harris poll found that more than three in 10 people in America say the pandemic makes them want to live in a rural area, and one in four now want to live in a suburb exterior to a major city. In a separate Harris poll, it was found that nearly 40% of city dwellers are considering leaving the city due to the pandemic. All right. So Tim Ellis, senior data journalist at Redfin, is quoted saying, based on what we're seeing in the data so far, it looks like the housing market in rural areas and small towns will weather the storm through the coronavirus shutdowns better than the big cities. We also may see uh, an increase in home sales in these less densely populated areas in the long term as well, as home buyers look to get away from the cities or just purchase a second home that they can retreat to when times in the city get rough. As companies continue to loosen their work from home policies, including Twitter, which just announced that all employees can work from home indefinitely, expect interest in rural and small town real estate to increase. So just kind of reiterating a lot of what we talked about in the podcast last week, but I just found this article really interesting as far as the stats that it has coming from Redfin which if you're not familiar with Redfin, it's kind of like a, a Zillow where you can post uh, properties, but they do a lot of like uh, real estate related data uh, studies. And uh, really, really interesting. I mean, those are huge numbers when you're talking about, you know, I think it was 115% uh, increase and 88% increase in searches for rural and small towns. Uh, and then also they quoted it saying that it was a 71% increase for towns with populations under 50,000 people. It's really hard to say, you know, like, cause I feel like a lot of times people have pretty short memories. Uh, you know, something while you're in, it seems awful and horrific. And then like a year later, you're like, oh yeah, that sucked. <laughs> but you, you know, it's like, will this be enough? And it kind of depends, I think on how long, COVID-19 lingers, how impactful it is in the city that you're living in. But the fact that, you know, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but like 
I, I want to say New York City metro um, area is like something like 16, 20 million people. You know, that's not a small number. Like if you're talking about a country with 300 something million people, you're potentially talking about five to seven percent of the country's population wrapped up uh, in one area that was heavily affected, you know, and it doesn't necessarily even have to be something that, you know, you got sick or, you know, loved ones got sick, but it's really just the experience of living in the city. Uh, I have a sister-in-law, uh, brother-in-law that live in San Francisco, actually Oakland, just across the water. And, you know, they haven't left their apartment. You know, he just went back to work a couple of days a week, but like, there, all those amenities, all those nice things that people want to live in the city for, for the convenience are all stripped away as well. So it's not just the the threat of sickness, but it's also the reason that you're paying that $3,000 a month in rent is kind of useless now. Like <laughs> you could live anywhere and you're spending all that money. And it's just like, you know, everything's a supply and demand. And if you can work from anywhere and all the, the nice things about where you live are stripped away and you have a really high rent, I can't imagine that many people saying, I want to do this forever. So it's going to accelerate the people that want to leave and go somewhere new. So the other thing I wanted to talk about today, um, recent article and recent story, this was from uh, nextcity.org and the author is Jared Bray, June 15th. So just just published recently, but it says uh, the title is, Will Ithaca's hashtag cancel rent resolution actually cancel the rent? So maybe you heard about this. Um, there's a kind of a hippie little town in the middle of uh, New York state. And it, it's interesting. So a lot of people think like New York, they have this misconception where it's like New York City is the entire state. Well, it's not. Obviously, there's upstate and in the middle of New York, a lot of farm fields, a lot of rolling hills and uh, the Finger Lakes. And there's this beautiful college town, um, Ithaca, and they have these gorges and these beautiful waterfalls and just like really interesting town. I've actually only been there a couple of times. My wife went to school at Ithaca um, and Cornell is there as well. So most of the uh, renters in that area are students and uh, going to either Cornell or Ithaca. And Recently, there was a uh, change.org, um, you know, petition started, got over 5,000, I think, signatures uh, to cancel the rent in Ithaca, and it's actually picked up quite a bit of steam. So 5,000 signatures over the past few months, the Ithaca Tenants Union has developed the demand uh, into a cancel rent campaign as part of a statewide campaign managed by Housing Justice for All. Earlier this month, under sustained pressure from the Ithaca Tenants Union and hundreds of renters, Ithaca became the first city in the United States to vote in favor of canceling rent. The strategy, a resolution requesting additional executive power for the mayor, isn't certain to pay off, but organizers and supporters are hoping that if nothing else, it inspires other cities to show their support for rent relief and builds pressure on the state to act. Our strategy is to do uh, organizing of people who is decision uh, effects first, because that's really the majority in a lot of places and focuses on convincing legislators second, Rand said. Ultimately, this should uh, be up to the people who are affected by it. Our system of government, it's been very clear during the crisis, have been insufficiently set up to handle it fully. On June 3rd, as the Ithaca Journal and other outlets reported, the Ithaca Common Council approved a resolution requesting that the New York State Department of Health authorize the mayor to forgive via executive order three months of all residential and small business rent payments and additional fees which are due through June 2020. An earlier statewide executive order gave the Department of Health the power to approve all local COVID-19 executive orders. So in Ithaca, the principle of the cancel rent effort is that the mayor, with the permission of the State Department of Health, would issue an executive order to erase all rent debts for residents and small businesses that accrued between April and June as part of the city's emergency public health response to COVID-19. So that's pretty interesting. I, I didn't really know until reading this article how this actually works, because I'm like, how does a mayor have the power to just be like, nope, you don't have to pay that. You know, it's, it's a pretty powerful thing to say. But according to this article, that is due to the permission from the State Department of Health which is really interesting that the State Department of Health is essentially dictating the economics of an entire town. And I mean, when I say this is a college town, this is a college town. Uh, so a lot of renters, very seasonal. You know, you probably go in there middle summer, all tourism, you know, people just kept checking out this gorgeous uh, area. And then the rest of the year, uh, a lot of college students uh, who pay really good rent money. So it says housing is, of course, a vital part of the public health response to a pandemic. The primary advice public health officials have been given is to stay at home to avoid being exposed to the virus and to stay home once infected to avoid spreading it to others. Health officials and housing advocates are both worried that restarting evictions could put even more people at risk of exposure needlessly. 
So while city council members briefly entertained a rent cancellation uh, measure in San Jose, cities have so far been unable to act on their own, concerned about certain legal challenges from property owners. Ithaca's approach is novel and a bold step, says Rebecca Gard, um, the campaign's manager for housing justice at Citizen Action of New York. What you typically find is that no municipality wants to go first on anything, she says, who is helping to manage the housing justice for all campaign and work with the Ithaca Tenants Union on the resolution. Once one municipality goes, it's enormously easier to get more municipalities to act. This is really an ingenious and yet very valid means by which to gain this power. So, uh, I mean, we've talked about this before on past podcasts. Like, what are, what are the downsides of this? Uh, the first ones that come to mind, obviously, is cash flow for the property owner. But then the fact that that property owner has to pay a mortgage and has to pay taxes. Well, if this sinks that property owner, let's say you owned owed uh, 10 or you owned 10 rentals in Ithaca, you know, and that's where, you know, you were making your money. And then all of a sudden you had three months of rent that were just canceled out. And let's say, you know, you were cash flowing about 10% on those rentals. So if the the, the rent was $1,000 and you're making $100 a month in that rental, well, that's going to really mess things up for you. Uh, let's say you had 10 rentals, right? That are all doing $1,000. So you got $10,000 a month. But really, the actual cash flow of it was $1,000 a month. And I know I'm just kind of throwing some numbers out there. But that means that you really owed money $9,000, right? So mortgages and whatever else you're paying taxes and everything else. So for those three months, instead of being up what you normally would have been $3,000, now you're down $27,000, you know? So... Uh, that is a huge swing, you know, and even if you want to say my numbers are crazy and you're like, no, that person's cash flowing 20%. Well, okay. Instead of being up $6,000, right. You can do the math. You're down $24,000 that, and this is not, you know, we're not talking about Procter and Gamble and Nike and these huge corporations. We're talking about a small business landlord, private landlord. So it's not like they have these cash reserves to be like, okay, yeah, I'll just, you know, throw $25,000 at this. And the other issue that we talked about on a past podcast is that when these landlords can't afford the rent, what happens is that they go into foreclosure and they can't, you know, keep up the properties. But one of the real big issues is they can't pay the debt. They can't pay that mortgage. Well, these mortgages a lot of times are bought up in packages by big Wall Street investors. So those mortgages are even tied into sometimes to people's pensions because these pension plans are managed by big money managers. And a lot of times it's not your traditional, like, oh, we're just buying the stock market. Like they're buying debt packages. And the idea behind that is when they're buying the debt, you know, these mortgages, um, a a cluster of them, they are getting a good percentage, but is banking on the fact that these mortgages are going to be paid. So it's just that trickle down effect. So I don't think a lot of times these, you know, the tenants union is thinking about the fact that you could be wrecking pensions for people if you, you know, and of course this isn't going to happen just if one college town does it, but the proponent from the Ithaca tenant union, um, Gerard is her last name. She said it, you know, once one municipality goes, it's just enormously easier to get more municipalities to act. And we have seen this with other uh, things such as statewide rent control, um, You have seen that pop up in Oregon and then California and then New York. And it's just kind of a dominoes type thing. So this is, uh, this is kind of dangerous stuff. Um, you know, and the other thing that's interesting too, is Ithaca is a very expensive school, Cornell state, you know, it's a little bit cheaper, but you know, because of this pandemic, what we're seeing is there's different tier schools. So there's tier one, tier two, tier three, tier one might be, you know, Yale, Harvard, Brown, you know, all Ivy league. Then there's your tier two schools, maybe like a a Boston college or something like that. And then you get your tier three, which is really your private schools. Like, uh, in my opinion, probably Ithaca, um, you could make the argument that it's a tier two school. I mean, it's good education, but it's very expensive. You're going to pay 30 to $50,000 a year to go there. And part of that the reason you're doing that is the experience, right? It's a beautiful campus. It's a beautiful place to spend four years of your life and to be able to uh, soak in all these experiences. And now if it's going to be distance learning, nobody's going to want to spend 30 to $50,000 to do distance learning 
at a school that really you're paying for the experience just as much as you're paying for the education. So what you're going to see is for a landlord, this is a very scary time, especially in college towns, because you're going to see less kids attending those schools. So there's going to be less demand for your property. And then you might on top of that have a three month rent cancellation that this is just going to sink a lot of landlords. And it's not uncommon for landlords to buy where they know, right? Most landlords are not buying, you know, properties in all these different states and they're diversified between, you know, single units and apartment buildings. No, like you find something you know and understand and you replicate it and you duplicate it. So what I think is going to happen is you're going to have a lot of small landlords in Ithaca that might own one property, five properties, seven properties, but they are not diversified at all these other places because that's the area they know and it works for them. So it's just really unfortunate because, and it's unfortunate for everybody. I I know I haven't really addressed it, but there's a lot of atrocities happening right now for renters. And it's just a really, really difficult conversation to navigate. But in my opinion, canceling the rent without having some sort of further support for the person who is in charge of paying that mortgage, the landlord, you got to have that at part of the system. If you're going to cancel the rent, you got to cancel the mortgage payments on uh, on those months as well. Otherwise, you're going to sink those landlords and then you, the, the housing is going to fall off. You, what landlord is going to pay to to upkeep a property when they're in the red, you know, because they just lost, you know, twenty thousand dollars in three months. So it's really important, I think, that they not only think about the tenants, but they also think about the landlords in the situation. So reading further in this article, it says the Department of Health operates as an extension of Governor Cuomo, Gerard says. I do not anticipate Governor Cuomo being supportive of this measure. So for me, what's vitally important is for a state agency like the Department of Health to operate within the intent of their purpose and with the autonomy that they should have to focus on health and public safety and not political consequences. So basically what she's saying is she doesn't anticipate the state governor to support this. So they're circumventing the governor and going to the Department of Health to kind of um, uh, oversee and uh, supersede uh, the governor's power. And it says that Ithaca uh, older person, Dukas Nguyen, who sponsored the resolution, I didn't realize that was a person's name. I apologize. I didn't mean to laugh at him. Uh, Who sponsored the resolution said it was only possible because of intense pressure from the Ithaca Tennis Union and its supporters. The group had initially asked for a change to the city code, and Nguyen says that members of the Common Council told them that it was almost certain to fail. Even the resolution requesting executive authority nearly failed, eventually passing by a vote of six to four. And uh, says that uh, he's not holding out hope for the Department of Health will approve the request. So we were honest that it was a long shot, but it was a catalyst for other activism. And hopefully it gets the state's attention. Even if they turn us down, it's a clear sign that there's a crisis. In the event that the state does approve the request, Nguyen uh, says the mayor uh, still won't act unilaterally, but instead create a task force that would sort through the most effective ways to cancel rent debt for tenants while protecting small landlords from foreclosure in the process. So it's all kind of up in the air still. It kind of depends on what happens with the State Department of Health. If they actually go through with this, then what the governor's reaction would be to this and how that all kind of works together uh, and seeing if they are going to figure out a way to protect these small landlords. Meanwhile, members of the Ithaca Tenants Union, many of whom who have spent countless hours organizing together despite never having met in person, say they're hopeful the Department of Health will actually approve the request. They're hopeful that the state will act to protect thousands of tenants who live in Ithaca and are struggling to make ends meet. And they're proud that they got uh, Ithaca to act first. It's not a testament to how progressive the city is that this could succeed, said Elena uh, Pfeiffer, an organizer with the Tennis Union. It's a testament to organizing and to showing how popular it is. So there's that in a nutshell of what's happening in Ithaca. And like we said, it's important to follow even if you don't own property in New York because there is a domino theory with these types of things. And if they figure out the pathway to do this by circumventing the governor and getting what they want, then you may see this replicated in other areas by getting the uh, the State Department of Health involved and giving more power to the local uh, governor or mayor, excuse me, local mayor to be able to cancel rent. So very, very interesting. I know that it's kind of scary uh, for landlords, but I'd like to believe, and it didn't make one small mention about while protecting small landlords from foreclosure in their process, but it'll be interesting, you know, uh, watching Ithaca and seeing what happens there, I think is um, 
the the thing that you're going to want to watch. And I forget what it's called, but in like legal terms, right? There's always a precedent, right? That's what you're looking for. They're like, well, has this ever happened before? Is there a precedent? And that's why these legal cases that set precedents are so important because it's going to change the way that the law is viewed going forward. Well, this is the same thing. They're essentially trying to set a precedent. And if they do, other towns are going to be able to look at this and say, all right, that is the roadmap. This is how we can get this done. And we don't even need the governor really to um, be the one who pulls the trigger on it. So really, really interesting stuff. Hopefully, you know, they figure out something that works for everybody. Uh, We want to be able to protect renters, but be able to protect landlords as well, because in a lot of ways they are uh, the backbone of a lot of the economy. You know, there's just so much trickle down side effects of this. If they were to just uh, hurt these landlords that just I think it'd be very difficult to recover from. So it sounds like they are considering all sides, but you know these things are still new and figuring it out. So hopefully if there is a roadmap created in Ithaca, they've got it figured out so that it's helping everybody involved. And um, yeah, uh, I know it's scary stuff for you guys uh, listening to that, but uh, I just want to keep you guys informed of what's going on as we progress through this. And that is obviously what probably the biggest news article uh, that I have seen pop in the last week is uh, what's going on out, out in Ithaca, New York. All right, guys, uh, that's it for this week. I, I hope you're uh, doing well where you're at. Um, I know uh, out here, things are starting to settle into a groove finally. Uh, wife is, uh, you know, uh, works in a school district, so off uh, starting pretty soon here in a couple of days. Actually, by the time you guys hear this, so it'll be a day or two. And uh, trying to just figure out our new normal. But I think that's really important uh, to understand, you know, things aren't going to be the same uh, for a while, but you can enjoy your new normal, make the best of it. And, uh, you know, keep uh, keep on keeping on, as they say in the movie Old School, right? I think that's what he says to Blue. Keep on, keep on trucking, you know? But I'm just kind of babbling at this point. All right, guys, I hope you have a great week and I look forward to catching up with you next week. All right, take care. Oh.